Because of his love, we've been set free.
Well, good morning, Southside Baptist. It is so good to see each and every one of you here today. If you are a longtime member, first time visitor, that is irrelevant. It is good to see you in this place, within these walls, beneath this roof, as we gather together to celebrate and make much of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of quick announcements that I do want to share with you this morning. We met, we had our 8 a.m. service, as we have been doing since we've been kind of pushing back and moving closer and closer to return to something like normal, but uh, this morning it was our last 8 a.m. service. Beginning next week, we are going to be meeting for one service on Sunday mornings, gathering together as we did last week. It's going to be the same as that way moving forward. So we are ending that 8 a.m. service. We'll be meeting for 9 a.m. Sunday school and, of course, 10 a.m. as we gather together for worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank God for that. It has been a long road. This, this past week, I noticed uh, every now and then, Whenever I get on Facebook, I will look at the memories. You, you know, the memories you can look back on, things you posted last year or five years ago. I, oftentimes, I enjoy doing that whenever it's pictures of my kids. Other times, I look back and think, Kyle, you were so stupid. Why did you say that? Why did you post that? Why did you do that? Well, this past week, one of my memories was the video we shot in my office announcing the reopening of Southside and all of those procedures that we were going to have to follow. And it has been a very challenging, very confusing year. Um, and I want you to know that I am so grateful for all of our volunteers this past week. So, so let, me, let me get you to do this, all right? And now, I need, I, we're not going to dwell on this, so you got you to snap to it, okay? If you volunteered in any capacity for a service here at Southside, no matter what the job was, would you please stand for just a second? Please stand and remain standing. There's more of you than that, all right? Let's, let's stand. All right, come on up. All right, thank you, thank you. Now, so keep standing. I'm not done. Keep standing. Musicians. Video, audio. A lot of these people, when we first got reopened, they listened to the sermon three times. <laughs> Anytime that I made a decision about something we were going to do, a way that we were going to reopen, I didn't do it with any of these people in mind. I did it with the church as a whole in mind. And they went along with it. They, they never questioned. They never complained. It's easy for me to say we're going to have an 8 a.m. service beginning on this date and do that for a while. It hit home whenever I walked in that first morning a little before 7 and all of these people were on stage practicing. I thought this takes a lot. And I want you to know that the smoothness and the ease that we enjoyed things for this past year had nothing at all to do with me and everything to do with these and other people. So Southside, let's express our appreciation to them this morning. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, a couple of things I do want to share with you also before we go to the Lord in prayer. Tonight, I would greatly appreciate your prayers. 7 p.m., I am thankful for the opportunity and humbled by the opportunity to be able to address our 2021 graduating class at Caldwell County High School. I will be speaking at the Bacular service this evening. I'm excited about this. Never done it before. All the years that I have been a pastor, been a preacher, I've never had the opportunity to do this, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So I would appreciate Appreciate your prayers at uh, at seven o'clock. Also tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, bright and early, myself, Scott Hughes, Doug Roper, we're going to be flying out and we're going to be spending the week down in Haiti with Miss Janie Fralix. This is a mission trip, but it's also what I'm calling a vision trip. We're going to go down there and explore ways that Southside can literally become more hands-on in our relationship with Miss Janie and the work that is taking place down there in Haiti. So we would appreciate your prayers. I won't be here Wednesday night. Brother Dane will be taking care of Wednesday night, so I hope and pray you'll come out and be a part of that. I will be back next Sunday. We're leaving out Monday morning, getting back, Lord willing, Friday evening, so we would greatly appreciate your prayers, all right? Also, immediately following service, VBS meeting over in the Life Center in the Youth Suite. If you are a, have agreed to help, we will need you there. If you are interested in helping, we need you there. Anybody who's interested in VBS over at the Life Center in the Youth Suite for a few minutes after the service today, all right? Let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity that's been given to us. Father, we pray that you would meet us in this place. And Lord, we pray that everything said and done would be pleasing unto you. Father, I pray for the decisions that need to be made, the lost that need to be saved, the wandering who need to return home. Father, I lift them all up to you at this time. Father, bless us, Lord, and use us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on, Southside, let's worship again.
is our God. We can never know how great God really is. There's, there are no words to express His greatness. And also, there are no words to really express His holiness. Jeremiah said, call unto me and I'll show you great and mighty things. And I believe God is revealing Himself to us today through His Word and through the worship we are doing together as a body of Christ. But listen, I want you to know when you leave this place today how holy God really is and that He expects holiness from you and from me. He expects holiness from His people that we might shine in a dark world, revealing the glory and the greatness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Only a holy God can make the sacrifice that He made for us that we might have eternal life. Only the Holy God. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness troubles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such Praises. What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold me, the one. Come and go. 
you a holy God we sing to your name we give you praises we ascribe to you the word that is due your holy holy name and we say thank you for your holy blood that was shed for us on the cross of Calvary that we might have eternal life thank you Jesus for such an awesome sacrifice for such unworthy people including myself there is nothing in us, Lord, by which we should gain glory, but all, all the glory goes to you. Reveal your word to us now, Lord. Make us into what you want us to be as we live for you, living out these lives. Help us to be a holy, peculiar people in the lost world that others might be saved. One of the most joyous things to happen to a pastor is when any individual comes to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Seeing a soul who was dead in trespasses and sins, made alive, born again to a living hope through Jesus Christ. That is just the gold standard of any experience that any individual can have to see and experience in the life of another. Oftentimes, as a pastor, one of the things that happens is a child will come to you or someone will bring a child to you and they are interested in salvation. They are interested in receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior. I try to deal with kids very, very gently and carefully because oftentimes emotion or, or seeing someone else do it, that can really lead in contributing to their decision. So you really want to make sure that he or she knows what they're doing and the ramifications of that decision. I will ask them a number of questions and inevitably one of the questions I always ask is this. Do you know what sin is? Now think about it, in order to be saved, you have to know in your heart that you are a sinner. And if you're going to know that you're a sinner, you have to know what sin actually is. So oftentimes whenever I ask a child that question, can you tell me what sin is, inevitably, overwhelmingly, the answer will go something like this. Sin is something you do that's wrong. And let's be honest, that is a very good, very correct, very biblical answer. Sin is indeed something you do that's wrong. But oftentimes when we think of sin, we only think in terms of the stuff that we do that we shouldn't do. The Bible speaks of this, to be fair. When you read the Ten Commandments, that recurring theme, that line that appears over and over and over again, thou shalt not. It's, it's an action we do that we shouldn't do. That's correct. But while that's correct, 
It's incomplete. Sin is not just the stuff we do that we shouldn't do. It's not just the stuff we say that we shouldn't say, the places we go that we shouldn't go. Sin is not just the stuff that we do. This morning, we're going to look at a sin. And to commit this sin, literally, literally, you don't have to do a thing. We are in our journey through what we're calling the seven daily sins. These sins that are so prevalent in our lives on a daily basis. We've, we've looked at the sin of pride. We've, we've looked at the sin of envy and how destructive and dangerous that can be. Well, this morning, we're going to look together at the subject, easily idle. And we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, looking down through verse number 11. And the sin that we're going to look at today that can very easily be committed, very easily be a daily sin, is the sin of slothfulness. Now, if we're being honest with ourselves, any time that you go to the Lord in a word of prayer, if you pray and seek God's protection from a sin, Probably not at the top of your list. You don't pray something like this. Lord, keep me today from slothfulness. Keep me to, help me today, Lord, to not be sloth-like in my actions. When you go to the Lord in prayer to confess your sin, you don't go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I lost my temper today. I'm so sorry. Lord, I, I snapped at my kids. I was rude to my wife. Lord, I've been so arrogant today. I've been envious today. And Lord, I've really been slothful. Like, it's not really on, our, on the top of our list. And when you think about it, that's what makes it so dangerous. The obvious enemies are not oftentimes the ones that cause us problems. It's the enemy in the camp that we don't even know is, is there. So we're going to look together at the sin of easily idle. Proverbs 6, verse 6, looking down through verse 11. Let's turn our attention to the word of the Lord. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep? A little slumber? A little folding of the hands to rest? And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. We're going to be extremely basic today. I think we've already conceded and acknowledged the fact that slothfulness is really not a sin that we give a lot of attention to. So basically what we're going to do today, we're going to keep things extraordinarily simple. We're going to look at a passage of scripture from Proverbs. We're going to work our way through it and we're going to see how we can viciously fight against the easy sin of idleness, the easy sin of slothfulness. Three things this morning that I want to turn your attention to from this text that will hopefully help us see how serious and how easy this sin is to take root in our lives. The first thing I want you to see is this, simply this. I want us to see, number one, what it is. When we think about being slothful, what do we mean by that? I'll be honest with you, this week, whenever I sat down Monday morning, knowing this is the direction we were going to go in the sermon, knowing this was the topic, I sat down at my desk and I thought to myself, I have no idea how to define this sin. If someone backed me into a corner and said, Preacher, tell me what it means to be slothful, I might have uttered something about being lazy and moved on. So if we're going to fight against it, if we're going to know how to deal with it, we need to know what it is. Here's a definition that I came up with this past week. Someone that is slothful can be described as having a habitual disinclination to exertion, laziness, or indolence. A habitual disinclination to exertion. 
Now, I said I came up with that definition. To be honest with you, I copied and pasted it from dictionary.com, all right? So that's what, that's not, I'm not the kind of guy who walks around using words like a habitual disinclination to exertion. Now, even if you don't know what that means, I think we can agree it sounds bad. And to put it another way in layman's terms, to say that someone is slothful literally means they just don't do stuff. They're not inclined to work. They're not inclined to show initiative. They're not inclined to really step out and be active and do the task that needs to be done. So Solomon, who writes Proverbs, Solomon, who is the wisest man to ever live, speaks to his son, and he says this to him. Look at verse number 6, 7, and 8. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. What does the ant do? What does Solomon want the sluggard to see in the behavior of the ant? The ant simply does what it needs to do when it needs to do it. According to the writings of Solomon, the ant doesn't have anyone cracking a whip saying, hey, break's over, get back to work. You got time to lean, you got time to clean. Chop, chop, let's go. The ant doesn't have anyone like that. It simply gathers its food in the summer, and it simply enjoys its food in the fall. The ant does what it is supposed to do when it is supposed to do it. It takes care of the tasks that it needs to get done. So yes, you could say that slothfulness is laziness. You could say it's a lack of discipline. You could say that it's a lack of initiative. It is simply an individual who refuses to do the things they have to do when they have to do them. Solomon says, look, you want an example of what to do? You look at the ant. You look at that little creature and all the work that it does because simply it has work to do. Now, understand something, okay? I'm going to cut you a little bit of slack. Rest and slothfulness are not the same thing. Rest is a gift from God. Hear what I'm about to say. You can glorify God at times simply by taking a nap. You can be found pleasing to the Lord at times simply by putting your feet up and resting from your labor. But hear what I'm about to say. You cannot glorify God. You cannot be pleasing to God by doing nothing but resting. In order to glorify God through rest, you have to complete the tasks that you have had to complete on that given day. Slothfulness is a sin against God. Rest is a gift from God. Look at what the Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Rest and slothfulness are not the same thing. Rest is what you do when the job is done. Slothfulness is what you are when avoiding the job to do. You can be pleasing to the Lord and rest. You cannot be pleasing to the Lord and be slothful. So let's move on to the second thing. We've seen what it is. It's someone who will not do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. That's what it is. But now let's move on to our second thing. Let's look at what it brings. Let's begin with the obvious. Slothfulness, the wasting of time, inevitably leads to loss and poverty. Wherever slothfulness leads, whatever slothfulness brings, it's not good. 
It's not anything that you or those around you are going to want. Hard work does not always guarantee prosperity. My grandfather worked for decades very hard in the coal mines, and he did not become a financially prosperous man. Hard work does not guarantee prosperity. Slothfulness always guarantees poverty. You are not going to get ahead, you are not going to be benefited by, and you're not going to be pleasing to the Lord by practicing the daily sin of slothfulness. Go back and look at what it says in our text there in verse 9, 10, and 11. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Now, poverty is spoken of here as being a robber. Some translations use the word bandit. It comes upon you. Earlier this week, I read in a Bible commentary, the word robber literally means one who walks about as a vagabond or a vagrant. The Bible portrays his fate like that of a man who is attacked suddenly by scarcity. Just as an unsuspecting victim would be assaulted by a bandit, it also seems to describe not an ambush but a constant hanging around, a badgering of vagrants who hang around the door always wanting more and siphoning off one's resources until everything is gone. If you are a slothful person, you're always going to be operating in the red. You're never going to be in the black. Let's think about it like this, okay? Parents, what is the big thing that you always want your kids to do at the house, okay? Something that you always have to get after them over because they just usually don't show the initiative to do it themselves. For us, it is clean your stinking room. Like, it's a big surprise that we want the room clean. Like, wow, you're kind of coming at me with this out of left field. It's always been there. It's a daily thing. Clean your room. Now, what does the kid say? And kids, I'm speaking to you right now, okay? What do you say? Okay, okay, I will. I will. I'll do it. I'll get to it. Hang on, man, I'm going to do it. The emphasis is always at a later time. It's going to get done easy on me now because it's going to get done in the future. All right, when I come back in here, this room had better be clean. You go away for a moment of time. You come back. I told you. I told you, I told you, I told you, clean the room. What do they say? They don't say, no, I'm not going to do it. I think it's stupid. I'm going to live in this field. I'm not going to clean my room. I don't care what you say. They never say that. I know, I know, I will. Kids, let me ask you, can you really enjoy life in those circumstances? I mean, can you really enjoy whatever it is you're doing that's so important under those circumstances? Knowing you've got a mom or dad who's just watching you, who's just looking at you, who's passing by casually, giving that side eye to see. You can't enjoy anything. Why? Because you are not doing what you need to do when you need to do it. A slothful man, no matter what is going on, can never be at peace. A resting person can because they've done the job. Because they're kicking back and taking easy. They can rest in the knowledge that when they get up, that job won't be waiting for them. Slothfulness always brings unease and turmoil on anyone who commits it. This is not God's will for your life. This is not what God wants for you. Not being, being slothful and not doing the things you need to do will inevitably lead to doing things you should never do. Let me say that again. Not doing the things you need to do inevitably leads to doing things you should never do. 
I was doing my daily Bible reading earlier this week. And, 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 part, and one of the days I'm, I'm reading in 2 Samuel. All right. In 2 Samuel, Saul is dead, David's king. And, and can I give you some of the headlines of 2 Samuel? Like in, in your Bible, over each chapter, it kind of gives like just a phrase that describes what's going on and what you're going to read. All right. Listen to some of the headlines of 2 Samuel. David, king of Israel. David moves the ark. The Lord's covenant with David. David's prayer of thanksgiving. David's victories. David's kindness to Mephibosheth. David's killing it. Here's another heading. David's sin with Bathsheba. You have all of those headings. All of the goodness. David's prayer of thanksgiving. David's victories. The Lord's covenant with David. Everything is great. Then you get this bad. Out of nowhere, you get this bad headline over 2 Samuel chapter 11. Well, listen to what it says. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. Now watch this. But David remained at Jerusalem. We've already known from one of the headings I read, David, king of Israel, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. But David remained at Jerusalem. I was thinking back to the battle, the, the victory David had over Goliath. Say what you want to about King Saul. He was there. He didn't step up, but he was there because kings went out to battle. It was seen as their opportunity to advance their kingdom, to advance the interest of their people. It was part of their kingly task. Kings go out to battle with their army. David remained behind in Jerusalem. David was not where he needed to be when he needed to be there. David was not doing what he needed to do when he needed to do it. And David was not around the people he needed to be around when he needed to be around them. And as a result... He meets a woman he should never have met. He commits an act he should never have committed. And he becomes something that he never should have become. All because he didn't do what he needed to do when he needed to do it. As active as David was, on this occasion, slothfulness crept into his life. By not doing what he needed to do, he ended up participating in things he never needed to do. Slothfulness hurts us physically, but it also hurts us spiritually. Your adversary, the devil, will take advantage of your idleness. He will take advantage of your slothfulness. What does the Bible say over in the book of Galatians? Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do the things you're supposed to do and you won't do the things you shouldn't do. Don't be bored. Don't be idle. Rest is fine. Slothfulness is horrible. And it sets the table for so many other sins. There is no way David could have possibly thought, I'm not going to go out with the army this spring and do what kings do and as a result commit adultery and become a murderer. David never thought that. No one ever does. But when we're idle, when we're lazy, when we're disinclined for physical exertion, we open the door to so much stuff and none of it is good. You've heard the expression 
The Devil Finds Work for Idle Hands. That actually came in the form of a poem written by a hymn writer so long ago, a guy by the name of Isaac Watts. He writes this, How doth the little busy bee improve each shining hour and gather honey all the day from every opening flower? How skillfully she builds her cell, how neat she spreads the wax, and labors hard to store it well with the sweet food that she makes. In works of labor or of skill, I would be busy too, for Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. In books or work or healthful play, let, me, let my first years be past that I may give for every day some good account at last. It's not good to be slothful. That's a sin in and of itself. But all this other stuff that it brings, it robs joy of life, it devoids us of purpose, it steals our opportunity to honor God with the good things that we do. It brings nothing good. You can't even enjoy your laziness because you've got all of this other stuff going on in your mind. You can enjoy your rest when the work is done. You cannot enjoy your laziness when there is work still to be done. So we've seen what it is. We see what it brings. Finally, we need to see this, how it's fault. It's easy. I dare say that before today, this sin probably wasn't even on most of our radars. It's easy to overlook and it's easy to commit. So how do we fight against the sin of slothfulness? Well, let's end at the beginning. Go back to verse 6. Look at what Solomon writes. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. The wisest man to ever live. A beautiful treasure trove of knowledge and insight spewing forth from his pen. And what's his advice? Go look at an ant and see what it does and mimic it. We have examples. I've already given you one example, an example of what not to do, David. Look at David and what he did and didn't do and learn from him. Look at those around you and be better for it. A couple of weeks ago, I read a really interesting book by General Jim Mattis. He, 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 he was a four-star general. He, he served as Secretary of Defense for a season. I read his book, very, very interesting book. It's part biography, part leadership, but one of the things that blew me away was how much reading military guys have to do. I, I mean, the, the private all the way up to the four-star, they've just got a lot of reading to do assigned to them. And something he said that really I, I thought hit home, he says this, Reading is an honor and a gift from a warrior or a historian who a decade ago or a thousand decades ago set aside time to write. We have been fighting on this planet for 10,000 years. It would be idiotic and unethical to not take advantage of such accumulated experience. And what he was saying was this, I'm a guy of war and there's been a lot of guys of war before me. I should learn from them. In order to fight slothfulness like any sin, you can see how it plays itself out in the victories and losses of others. Understand something. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, that moment of conversion, you were remade. You were born again. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, for we, speaking of those who are saved, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God did not save you because of your good works, but he certainly saved you for good works. You were created, recreated in Christ for the purpose of good work. God did not save you to be lazy. God did not save you to be a sluggard. God did not save you to be a slothful husband or a slothful wife. God did not save you to be a slothful parent or a slothful child, a slothful teacher or student, boss or employee. That is not why he saved you. I have said this before and I will say this again. Christian men and women ought to be the best employees and best employers that they are. They ought to be the best teachers and the best students. Whether you are digging a ditch or operating on someone's brain, no matter what you are doing, you have a responsibility to do that task well in a way that brings honor and glory to God. The Bible says as much. Colossians 3, 22 through 24. Bond servants. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you are doing, it is to be done for the Lord. You cannot be slothful for the Lord. You cannot be derelict for the Lord. You cannot glorify God by not doing the things you need to be doing. God did not recreate you to be that way. This sin has ruined so many lives. It has ruined so many families, so many organizations, so many churches when God's people simply refuse to do what they need to do when they need to do it. It is easy, easy to do nothing. So easy. And it is dangerous so dangerous to do nothing it could be this morning that the people I'm speaking to you are right on the line like David of losing it all not because of anything you've done but because of everything you haven't done Christ saved you, Christian, for more than that. So whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. I will mop this floor as unto the Lord. I will speak to my spouse as unto the Lord. I will do my job, write this paper, give this lecture, take this test as unto the Lord. There's a whole lot of sin that requires us to do stuff to commit it. A whole lot of sin. There's a few sins to commit them you ain't got to do nothing and this is one of them the problem today is not what you're doing it's everything you're not doing so here's the question that I have for you as we come to the close of the service what are the things in your life that need to be done that are just hanging over you 
over your family, over your church. Nobody out there is an island unto themselves. Everything you do has a ripple effect for everyone else around you. So what is it that you need to be doing that you are not doing? Stop being the kid in the bedroom saying, I I'm going to do it. When in reality, you keep going down that road, it will never happen. What needs to be done that's not being done? And what can you do about it? What will you do about it right now? Brother Dane, if you would come, others who have a part in the invitation. I preached a tad longer this morning than I expected to. I apologize for that. But the good news now is I, I don't really have anything else to say. You know you know what's hanging around over you. You know the room that needs to be cleaned. And you know there's only one way for that room to get clean. And that's for you to get up and clean it. So will today be the day, now be the time? Or will you just kick that can further down the road, all the while mumbling, intentions of what will be done at some non-determined, unspecific later date. Will you keep being slothful? Or will today you honor God by beginning to do the things that need to be done? As always, the choice is yours choose well. Father, bless this time of response. Use it for your power, your glory, and purpose, and do what needs to be done here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and die?